Hello, everyone. Welcome to this technologycatalog.com webinar. My name is Vincent van Beuzekom. I'm managing partner at Deployment Matters and responsible for the technology catalog development and operations. Today, our focus of this webinar will be on two subsurface technologies. And for that matter, I'm joined today online by our senior advisor for uh, subsurface technologies from the Deployment Matters Network, Dave Masson, and by the two uh, presenters of today. On my side here in Delft, Panos Dugaris from Delft Inversion, and online with the, uh, with the webcam on, Peter uh, Cunningham from Seraphim, who will be presenting the future uh, technology. Both technologies are taken from our subsurface module on the technologycatalog.com website. So this is the overview with the various modules that you see when you go to the, uh, to the main page. And here are the two technologies that will be the subject of the webinar uh, today. Uh, before I hand over to, uh, to Panos for the first uh, presentation, Dave will lead us through the Q&A after each of the uh, sessions. And if you have any questions for, for Panos or for Peter, please use the chat functionality on the right-hand side where you can actually leave your questions. And you can already start typing your questions during the, the presentations. Dave will actually pick them up at the uh, uh, Q&A as they, uh, they come in. So having that said that, I would like to hand over to, uh, to Panos uh, on my side for the first presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Thank you very much, Technology Catalog. Thank you for being here today with us. Let's start with a video that would explain more or less my point, and then uh, we can uh, enjoy the rest, of the rest of the webinar. So web view helps you get the most out of your data. And uh, let's take a look now to, uh, to the team and uh, technology. So if we start off with uh, the founders, uh, it's a bit awkward to start with uh, CV, but uh, we always like to give a bit uh, how we started. Um, and they all started with uh, Dries Kizov, our professor and uh, co-founder of the company. Uh, after he spending 24 years with uh, Shell doing quantitative interpretation and seismic inversion studies all over the world, he decided to build uh, the new generation, what we call the wave equation-based inversion. And uh, as part of, of his uh, retirement plan, uh, with, together with Peter Hafinger and myself, we started off the company uh, seven years ago. And uh, the focus is, is very uh, specific. Can we actually find out where this technology adds value to exploration, development, and production products 
uh, projects and uh, what are the limitations. So we've set out on this uh, path to find out in different uh, regions, different challenges and uh, test the limits. And uh, as you see, we have quite some success uh, in Australia, especially Northwest South, where we have uh, some of our business cases uh, developed over the years, but also uh, in Europe, Norway, a bit in the States, West Africa, and a bit in the Middle East. On the bottom, you see a list of our clients with whom we have an ongoing relationship. Now, let's get a bit more into the technology. Why does WebAVO add more value? And one of the key aspects is the parameters that it delivers. So um, it does not solve for the usual elastic parameters, uh, acoustic impedance, serial impedance, as any other product would do commercial packets in the market. But uh, it does go straight into bulk and serial modulus, or if you prefer, the compressibility in compliance. Why do we do that? First of all, because these parameters compressibility in specifically is three times more sensitive to hydrocarbons compared to acoustic impedance. In uh, absolute terms, it means that uh, you can see in tighter reservoirs or fill. Uh, and that leads also to the, uh, the second bullet that says enables the identification of fluids. Even in uh, tighter reservoirs or even carbonates, you have a chance because of this uh, uh, extra dynamic range. On top of that, uh, there is a natural separation of lithology from saturation effects. Now, let's illustrate these points on the on the cross plot on the left-hand side, where we see a sandstone reservoir that has seen both gas and brine, gas being red and brine being uh, uh, water, uh, sorry, blue. You would agree with me, I guess, that uh, these two clouds have followed the same trend, and uh, an inversion would be hard to discriminate them if we plot exactly the same clouds in the compressibility shear, do, uh, shear compliance domain, you will see, first of all, this uh, uh, enhanced sensitivity to pore fill in the uh, range of the uh, compressibility uh, and the scatter of the uh, direct cloud. At the same time, you will see the two different trends. And that comes from the fact that shear compliance or shear modulus, as you may know, is the only parameter that is truly insensitive to pore fill. And that gives you the natural separation between lithological effects, which is uh, on the shear compliance axis, to pore fill effects that map very nicely on the compressibility axis. So in, all in all, with these parameters, you uh, can infer more information about your reservoir from seismic data. Now, on top of that, the actual algorithm, the engine behind WebAVO, is a fundamentally nonlinear uh, methodology. So uh, instead of using only primary energy, which is what any linear uh, methodology would, uh, would use out there, it also models and takes into account independent multiples within the reservoir or above, depending on your inversion window. It would, it's fully elastic, so it would take into account multiple mode conversions as well. And of course, it would take into account transmission effects, which are very, very uh, useful, especially when you have high contrast in, in the subsurface. And what does the user uh, get if they use all these sophisticated tools? Is that they get an extension of the bandwidth on the low hand side. Typically what we see in our uh, projects is that if the seismic starts around seven hertz, we do get a, an update of our low frequency model down to four, three hertz. And that's exactly the part of the bandwidth that gives you the more accurate results that you're after. At the same time, it can uh, some gas water contact may live in there or other effects that you would like to map out. Let's see now the people. What would we use WebAVO for? And uh, most of the business cases we have live in the exploration development uh, domain, of course, and the abstract exploration prospect risking is uh, number one, and the identification of piece gas compared to uh, live gas is, uh, is number one. So uh, I have a slide uh, afterwards that illustrates uh, the point. Reservoir delineation, obviously, when signal to noise ratio is not that good, um, is it can be a, a nice objective, especially because we're pushing the boundaries of resolution. At the same time, exploration development setup, the fluid characterization is always holy grail of any seismic reservoir characterization uh, product. And uh, if we talk about uh, very scattering and very nonlinear. Uh, geology, like uh, coals, for instance, or uh, basalt, 
then the follow-up characterization becomes uh, becomes a problem or below chalk, for instance. Uh, some of the cases we've, we've detuned nicely with this inversion uh, technique. When we go to production, obviously the fact that uh, the parameterization can map the pressure effects on shoe compliance and the saturation effects on the compressibility that gives a natural discrimination between the two parameters that otherwise would mingle together and you wouldn't be able to uh, distinguish. So that's a, a killer application as well. And of course, if we use the forward model engine alone without the inversion, then you can do a very nice input multiple investigation where you can pinpoint where the actual uh, generators are so that you can drive your processing or your even your inversion. Now let's go into this very small case study that is really fresh, it just came out in September, was presented by one of our clients, Woodside. Uh, it comes from Carnaval Basin, and basically uh, what uh, we have here is there are two wells that were drilled at the time of the uh, inversion, but on the left-hand side is the inversion that they had in-house with uh, one of the most uh, known uh, packages out there. Uh, we have a well on the, on the west that is um, alive, found uh, 80% saturation, and then uh, a second well was drilled on the second prospect that you see in the center of the picture, and that turned out to be a residual. And uh, if you look into the 1D plots below, you'll see why that they, they these two wells have exactly the same response. If you run a web AVO, you should get a, a real discrimination between these two prospects. Even the third prospect does not appear at all, but also uh, quantitatively, and that is really nature that WebEVO gives you, that extra accuracy uh, and the dynamic range of the, com of the compressibility that really tells you a full story that you can see live versus residual. And this business case we've exported also to other places in uh, Southeast Asia. Now, if we talk about business impact, obviously you can drill less dry holes by de-risking prospects. But also, if you have, uh, if you're a larger operator, you have a lot of uh, prospects. You can can be very efficient, very effective for uh, ranking your portfolio. Where the real value may come, and uh, there is another case study now in the public domain where uh, Woodside has done that, is that they tried to build early on, based on exploration wells only, a reservoir model that they uh, injected in the properties that came from the inversion, and that surprisingly gave them a very good accuracy of the P10, P90 range post-drill, already pre-drill. So uh, this is something that we would like to see more and uh, we want to talk more to the reservoir engineers on how we can take our results into the, their models because that really shows the value that uh, this technology has to give. At the same time, on the time uh, domain, having such a reservoir model, this 80% reservoir model early on, that means that you can push your FID earlier uh, because you, you don't have to wait for all the other wells to build that. And of course, uh, using all these multiples, uh, that means that you don't have to spend so much time in preparation in your gathers. My last slide, without the team, what we would be, and uh, we are growing the team and I hope that soon we will um, be in more regions as we are now and I also have our software in the uh, public domain. Thank you very much. So, uh, hey. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Panos, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Dave Masson here. Uh, I just want to do a quick sound check. Uh, Vincent, can you confirm that uh, you can hear me okay? Yes, we hear you clear. Excellent, excellent. This morning's session wasn't quite so good. Okay, so I, I, I'm indeed going to reiterate the request from the others, uh, folks, if you could indeed uh, enter your your uh, personal questions on the chat box. Meanwhile, I, ha I do have one I prepared earlier. Um, and uh, you may actually have already answered this in your last sentence or two, Panos, but the, the question is, do you have an example already where an operator has actually increased their SEC pooled reserves on the basis of the technology? Uh, yes, there is this example that is in public domain uh, where it was um, not really, uh, it was an example, uh, let's say an example that was run after the drill, so it was a post-mortem, uh, if you prefer, but then still it was um, uh, it was clear <coughs> that if you can get the narrow down your P10, P90 pre-drill down to very close to what they have, they got post-drill, that is, uh, is very powerful. So uh, we look forward to 
getting more of this exposure through our through our clients because that's nothing we offer ourselves, and we hope to see some more success stories in the future. Very good, thanks, uh, thanks, Panos. And there's a name I do recognise, Thomas. Good to see you pop up here. We haven't seen each other for more than 15 years, by the way. Thomas's question is, uh, what is your business model, Panos? Our current business model is based on services. So we get the data and we do the seismic version, of course, with close collaboration with our clients and we return the data. Uh, but we are embarking now on a, on a second software development cycle with the aim of uh, releasing the software to, uh, to clients uh, in a year's time. At the same time, we are now in the fundraising uh, procedure. So it should be a dual model um, in one or two years' time where we have both software uh, deployed in the cloud or in cluster and uh, the services uh, running in parallel. Very good. Thanks, Panos. And by the way, everybody, you can, of course, get in touch with Panos directly if you want a little bit more detail on any of the questions. And the question from Alec is, what are the inputs to the program? And can the program take in data buried in textual files? Alec, I will need a bit more information. What do you mean uh, textual files? I mean, if you refer to text files, then we would have to find a way to um, take them from text files into uh, SegWi format, and then uh, it does something we definitely could uh, investigate with you. But uh, the inputs otherwise is um, the normal inversion input. So we work with usually pre-stack data. This can be also post-stack data, but then you don't get so much value out of it. Uh, usually we work with uh, micro migrated offset gathers as anybody else, and we would require a velocity model and at least one well to calibrate or some information geological that we can calibrate against. Great, and I think this has to be the last question for you, Panos. It's from Mohammed, And he asks, how, uh, how does web AVO uh, attenuate multiples? Uh, first of all, I need to put a disclaimer there. We're talking about multi intimate multiples within the inversion window. But at the same time, uh, these multiples, they would be mapped back to their origin. So they would be mapped back to the multiple generators. So in principle, we are removing these effects. If you would interpret the inversion results and you would have a multiple crossing through your reservoir, for instance, that would be uh, removed from the uh, inversion uh, output. So the last parameters would show you only the layers without the imprint of the multiples. And that is done, of course, by modeling them and mapping back the energy to where it became, where it came from, where which is the multiple generators, which are in the river. Very good. Well, hey, once again, thanks very much, Panos. I think we're out of time on your section. Yeah, and uh, thanks, folks, those who have provided the questions. Um, it's now time to move on to Peter, Peter Cunningham, who is the CEO owner of uh, the Seraphim Company, which markets the uh, the future general purpose production forecasting system. Peter, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to tell you, um, obviously, I'd like to tell you all about the benefits of our software, but to, to make it a bit more general, I'd like to talk about um, the benefits and practicality of general purpose production forecasting. So the idea is that you can generate a whole range of forecasts, short term, medium term and long term from a single system. Our perception is that in most oil companies, while production forecasting is central to so many business processes, there are problems um, that because there isn't there hasn't been one system suitable for everything, uh, oil companies tend to use a range of different and quite overlapping systems. This gives a lot of duplication of effort and, and inconsistencies. And of course, from that, you have high expenditure on uh, software licenses and, and support. But the biggest problem with that is that this duplication wastes one of the most precious, some of one of the most precious resources of the uh, oil company, namely the expertise uh, about, you know, the the central process of, of the, the, the company producing oil. So what does our system do? Um, we believe that it's the world's first 
a, a true general purpose production forecasting system. Historically, when you think about it, what do we need from a forecast uh, thing system? We need to be able to honor the, the well performances. We need to be to, to honor facility and pipeline constraints, and we need to represent all the operational shutdowns and so on. And that basically adds up to full integrated asset model calculations. But the difficulty was that these were too slow and cumbersome to be used in, a, in, a, in quite a few practical environments, you know, in operational planning. Um, if you need an answer in, you know, in, in, in half an hour, it's no good if your uh, integrated asset model takes five hours to run. The key pr uh, breakthrough for, uh, on future side, and it's, it's not restricted to future, there are, there's other software that also has achieved that, uh, is to have fast integrated asset model calculations. So with that, and with a range of workflow, the workflow tools that are in the software, we've got a system that our, that our customers use for, in, as I said, for a single system that they can use for their short term, their medium term, and their long term production forecasting. In that in that list of uh, uh, customers, particular it's maybe particularly of interesting to note Brunei Shell. Uh, they have just completed constructing a integrated asset model. Of, of their system. So it's with about 300 wells under pressure control and about 700 wells under rate control. And that is, we believe, uh, the, by quite a margin, the biggest integrated asset model in, in the world currently. So what is the key to achieving uh, fast integrated asset model calculations. Historically, most integrated asset models started from solving pressures, which they did in an iterative manner. And then there was an outer loop to put in rate constraints and the optimization of wells uh, required to for, 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 for that. And so that gave a double iteration Partly by accident, Future has come up with a different answer. We started from trying to solve uh, rate constraints. So we started with a, the problem of, you know, with, if you've got a whole stack of wells and you've got a, a system with various with rate constraints, what's your optimal choice of wells to flow? Which, which choice of wells will maximize your value while honoring all the constraints. That's a purely linear problem and so can be solved uh, fast and robustly with linear solvers. And when it came to adding pressure calculations, what, what's been done is essentially it's a multi-dimensional application of the newton raphson method. So the, the 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 pressure relationships are not uh, linear. You know, the, if you can consider, you can clearly see that when you look consider the the reservoir inflow and the tubing performance curves. They're not straight lines. So they're curves. But what what the, the uh, our algorithm does is it starts it solves the individual worlds first in one by one. So it, it makes a guess at the tubing head pressure and solves the intersection of the uh, of the tubing performance and the reservoir inflow to calculate a rate. Now that rate isn't taken as the final answer, um, but instead, sorry, um, sorry, uh, that, but that that answer is then you. That's a, those individual well solutions are taken at the point at which the um, 
tubing performance and the reservoir inflow are linearized, and those linear relations are then put into the global uh, linear solver. The end result is you've got something that runs between 100 and 1,000 times faster than the older algorithms. So what do you end up uh, with that? You, with that algorithm, you can have a general purpose forecasting system. You can reduce duplication and improve consistency. You can get away from the, the use of spreadsheets to, you know, to supplement all the, the system. You can, what you can end up with, in essence, is better quality production forecasting, and that results in big benefits to, to oil companies. Um, before moving on to questions, I'd just like to briefly show you um, the results of a, a run we did during the course of this morning's session. Uh, Vincent, is, is, the, uh, is the future uh, model visible? Yes, we see it on the screen. Oh, not anymore. So it was there a second ago. So please share it. Okay. okay, just give me one moment. Okay, is it uh, visible? Yes. Okay, so this is a model with a complicated gas production network with about 189 wells under uh, pressure uh, control. So there's gas lines, uh, separators, compressors, and th here we're looking, this particular node, we're looking at the, uh, the oil export. And we ran, first of all, um, the, the normal forecast, and then for trial, during, during yet this morning's session, we put in a water constraint of 5,000 um, and then ran it. And it took five, four minutes to generate. It's, so the whole network was solved and profiles for all the individual nodes were, were, and wells were, were constructed. But here, this is the results for this particular node with the constraint. So we've got a, we've, the top line is the initial profile, and then the second line is the, the water profile with our 5,000 um, meters cubed per day uh, limit. And then the results in terms of oil production uh, are there. So that, that gives you uh, some idea of, you know, the, the speed of the system. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for your attention. So uh, perhaps if we move on to questions. Sure. Well, th hey, thanks, Peter. Thanks for that. And uh, indeed, I'll invite everybody who's on the line to uh, submit questions via the chat box. As before, I do have one which I'm going to put to Peter already. Uh, it's one I <laughs> cooked up whilst, uh, whilst he was talking. Um, Peter, most assets do have a variety of forecasting systems in place already. In your experience, how much effort is required to convert existing systems to a, a unified future forecasting system? It doesn't take long to put the data into the system, a few hours. Um, what takes time, and it can take a, a lot of time, is preparing the information uh, pre about you know, the suitable lift curves, the network geometry, and, and everything else. Um, but on the whole, I would tend to say this is an area where the longer it takes, the more you want to do it, because it's precisely for these very big and complicated systems that you get the most benefits from reducing duplication. Very good. Um, I still don't have any questions from anyone else appearing so far, so I do have another one for you. And uh, the, the next question is related to business processes within an oil and gas company, and I know you will have encountered this with, uh, with Brunei Shell. And how easy, the question is, given that forecasts are central to all business processes, whether they be reserves uh, definitions and bookings or business plan submissions, 
or or indeed short term um, short term analysis of optimization opportunities. Uh, how easy is it to adapt the future program to adapt to dovetail with existing company processes uh, to to make the program provide output which suits processes further down the line? How flexible is it, in other words? It's, 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 it hasn't been a problem with our existing customers. Um, you can, it's set up to generate a whole range of forecasts and the setup is sufficiently general that you can generate the range of forecasts you need for reserves or you can generate for short term planning, you would tem t tend to want a different forecast, namely you're generally a a central one and then various what if cases you know different uptime you know what happens if we had 100 percent uptime all that sort of stuff so the setup is general enough to to generate that one interesting question is um when it comes to providing uh profiles for post-processing now on the one hand you can uh, fairly simply export the, the, the profiles and then uh, and, and put it into another system. But our experience is that what you really want to do is, you know, continue the logic of going for a general purpose system. You don't, you want to put, to try to get all your calculations into a single system. So, for example, if you want to know, uh, incremental sales profiles, incremental fuel and flare, it's better to use to generate that within future rather than export it only to find out that your some of your assumptions in the post processing start affecting the actual forecasts themselves. Very good. Well hey Peter, thanks very much. I think you're touching there on the efficiency benefits of the of the system. Um, still no uh, questions from anyone on the call here. Um, so once again, reiterate the point I made earlier. But you can indeed get in touch with Peter uh, to, um, you know, bottom out exactly how future could potentially provide a benefit to your assets. And on that point, I think I'll, I'll close and I'll hand back to Vincent to, uh, to close the session. So thanks, Dave. Yeah, just as a small final remark uh, from my end. So if you have any questions, uh, actually for the uh, for the three gentlemen. Um, then you can easily uh, route that via us and then use the email address info at deploymentmatters.com and then uh, we will bring you in uh, in direct contact with the presenters or uh, with Dave for that matter. So uh, as a last thing, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dave and the presenters for uh, today. Thank you very much. And uh, for your information, our next uh, webinar will be on December 12th and it will be about water management uh, technologies. So uh, just keep on uh, looking at our LinkedIn posts as the registration will be announced as soon as it's open. Thank you for now, and hope to see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye.